All right, all right. So, Seth Savoy. What's up, dog? Nothing much, dude. Yeah? Nothing much. I need to get back into that editing studio. Yeah? Yeah. How uh, how far along in the edit are you guys? I just turned in my first director's draft. Wow. Which is like a second pass, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So, there's still like... um, I watched the movie this weekend, and I thought, "What idiot directed this movie?" <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think if you if you don't have that response, it's something's, something's wrong. wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's cool. Um, like how how long did the edit take? Like, what was that process like? Oh man, it was it's I don't, it's so weird. I mean, I have um, creative control over it in Final Cut, Holy so shit. it's kind of funny to like. You really do have to listen to those producers, even though you're like, fuck you. I'm not going to listen to you. I have creative control, <laughs> motherfucker. But then, read like, and weep. Yeah, and then you read their notes, and you're like, oh, that's totally legit. Like, I do yeah. need to change that. <laughs> you know? Um, uh, but it drives you insane, dude, sitting in an editing booth that's, like, in a cave for 14 hours a day. It's just like... and then Holy you, shit, and then, 14 hours a day. Yeah, and then you just start going crazy because you're looking at your own yeah. stuff and judging it so much, you need to take like you know work on it for two weeks, take a week off, mm-hmm. unless you just go insane. Right. Damn, so, dude. And are you working with an editor? I am. Um, this guy named Dean Gonzalez, who he's normally a doc editor, but um, he's a really cool dude. He came to me and was like, Seth, I know this is an indie, but I've, you know, been following it and whatever your budget is, give me a third of it to edit. And if you don't like what I do, then you can spend that other two thirds on hiring someone else. And he's been great. Damn. So I've had no problem with him. Yeah. He's been killer. How'd, how'd you get connected with him? Um, I think he reached out. I, I actually, um, there's a place in the city called Noise Floor. I've heard of them. And they are, um, there's someone that I worked with on my very first short film. Um, Corey Koken is the head of it, and he's a mm-hmm. professor at Columbia. And I just bugged the shit out of Corey every single day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was a student at the time. I couldn't pay him shit. <laughs> um, but I was like, yo, Corey, I got a draft. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Just watch it, and I guarantee you'll, you'll want to do the sound design. And he was like, I'm not going to fucking do that. Yeah. And so I bugged him every day for like two weeks. I was like, Corey, watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. And eventually did. He was like, this is dope as shit. Yeah, we'll do it. This is your feature? Um, This was a short this film. This short. Did. Yeah. Nice. And he was like, I'll make a deal with you. I'll color and sound design or I'll majority sound design for them. But I'm, I made the same deal with the colorist of um, that they were to do it for free. Uh, for every short I ever make, and they get my first feature. Wow. And so, you know, on the feature, I had a budget for them, and it, it mm-hmm. came back around, you know? Yeah, yeah. So so the lesson there is be so good that... <laughs> well, I don't even <laughs> that, think that it was people want to do it for free, and then, because uh, they know eventually you're going to have a feature. That exactly. Can, and, yeah. and I don't know, if you bug anyone long enough, yeah, they're going to the crack. Shit out of them they're going to crack. Yeah, for sure. Love that. And I've learned that through every single like experience on that. Like finding money, that's such an important thing. You yeah. have to bug the shit out of people. Right. So, nice. so yeah, no, Corey's awesome. And so he actually connected me to Dean. And he was like, yo, I can vouch for Dean. He's like a crazy mm-hmm. editor, super nice guy. And the big thing about an editor is like, I don't really get along with people that are like, kind of have like a clash personality. Like, they're not going to tell me what to do with my movie. Right. Like, you can show me and say, hey, which one do you think is better? And I'll probably agree with you. But, like, the thing is, is you're not going to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to edit it like this when I want it like this. Yeah. And so Dean was just, like, a really cool, just like, yo, whatever you want, yeah, whatever makes it best. Mm -hmm. So he's cool. Nice. Um, I'm just going to turn your light down ever so slightly. Sure. Go for it. I think it's a bit too bright. Oh, we're going to get Sandy in the frame. <laughs> Hell yeah. Right shoulder. Hell yeah. <laughs> she she plays a role in, in my movie. She does? Yeah, her, uh, she plays the role of Sammy. <laughs> 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 it's a real stretch for her. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know. I, 
I read somewhere it's just like if you want to make a movie, just write a movie around all the shit you got. And I was like, I have an apartment and a dog and a bunch of film equipment, like. And friends that would totally do it. So yeah, like, why and not? friends that would be stoked to help out if I just bought them snacks and shit. Yeah. <laughs> um. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, let me write when we started back. So uh, I want to. I definitely want to get into the movie um, as much as sure. possible, but I, d- I want to take a step back and just, um, you know, hear more about you, how you ended up in Chicago from Little Rock, uh, sure. how you got into film. So if you want to start uh, at the beginning of your filmmaking journey. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally do that. Yeah. Um, uh, I was always like a theater kid, like one of those theater nerds. Yeah. And so. Um, and when and when you do theater, and I did it for a really long time, but when you do mm-hmm. it, you start to realize that like every performance is different, right? Like opening night, the first scene may just be amazing, and and what that scene does, you can never replicate again. And so even on the second show, and the third show, and the fourth show, that it's always different, and that always bugged the shit out of me, because like it's never perfect. Yeah. And then that's kind of where film came in, is that you can grab those takes and find those shows that are just perfect, put them all together and have how it should be. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so uh, what I did was I was I was a I was shit at school. I was always shit at school. <laughs> I was like a C plus kid. Yeah. Uh, and I was hyped about it. I thought C pluses were like the fucking place to be. Um, and, uh, so much better than a C dog. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, I applied to all these schools. I got a 24 on my ACT and I thought I was a God, you know? (laughs) Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I started to apply into all these film schools and they're like, man, your grades suck. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and so I got into like some pretty good ones. I got into Chapman and I got into Columbia and, um, and all of them were like, yeah, I mean, we'll let you come here, but it's going to be like 40 G's. And I went to my parents. I was like, hey, sign this loan. And they were like, fuck no. Wow. You are stupid. If yeah. you think that this is a good idea, you're an idiot. Um, and I was so mad at them for the longest time over it. Mm-hmm. And um, so the only place that I got a full ride to was this uh, really small school in, Arkan- in Arkansas called uh, uh, University of Central Arkansas, which they had a filmmaking program. So um, I kind of decided to do something extremely aggressive <laughs> And uh, I went there, and at the time I had a buddy who um, uh, his dad owned pretty much the only music venue in Arkansas. And so I pretty much came up to him and was just like, hey, you know, for 200 bucks a performance, I will shoot every single person that performs there. He was nice. like, sure, done. So, Man. yeah, I shot. Money in the bank. Yeah, I ended up shooting Kanye, Twista, what? Asher Roth. R. Kelly, um, Mike Jones. Holy shit. Yeah. And so after two years at UCA and doing that for two years, I applied again to Columbia and had all these people on my reel that were like huge, you know? Um, And they gave me a full ride. They were like, you already got your basics? What? We'll finish out these two years. Yeah. Damn, dude. So that's kind of what happened. Um, Yeah. And then I packed all my shit into a U-Haul and moved here. Wow. How's that? And I used to live up in uh, Andersonville. Mm -hmm. I used to love it. That was like my favorite part of the city. Yeah. (laughs) Right by the beach. It was awesome. Yeah. I I dig Uptown. I'll fuck with Uptown. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like away from all like the bullshit Wrigleyville shit. And it's just like easy. Yeah. A little more chill. Nice restaurants. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy. Pretty girls. Yeah. It's cool. So yeah. Yeah. And then uh, that was pretty much it. And Columbia was just as weird as I expected. You yeah. Know? Like, well, total. well, most like in my experience, like uh, my company has had 150 interns since mm-hmm. I started it in 2012, and it always seemed like we'd get great interns from DePaul, like super brainy interns from University of Chicago, and like kind of like 50 percent great and 50 percent shitheads from Columbia. <laughs> Yeah, I'd say, I mean, I knew <laughs> I knew guys there that were just fucking lost. Yeah. You just, you literally meet them and you're like, the the last thing, last situation I want to be is stuck in an elevator with this guy. Like, he's just so weird. Like, 
Um, yeah, and and it just it seemed to me that a lot of people that went to Columbia just kind of had rich parents and no direction. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. weird. And like personally, it it's just kind of rough. Like I, f- I really feel like um, Columbia has been going downhill, but um, they used to have amazing professors. Mm-hmm. Like um, like uh, I had one. His name's John Hancock. Which he he's a pretty big guy. I mean he he did um he did uh the first Robert De Niro movie called Bang the Drum Slowly, and that that was a porno film. That yeah, <laughs> it sounds like it. Um, and that made Robert De Niro. Wow. Like that single film was that a Roger Corman movie? I don't know. Um. But John directed it, and then after that, he got a call from Martin Scorsese and was like, hey, is this guy any good? Like, wow. If he is, like, give me an intro to him. And John was like, yeah, sure. And so like, that was a big thing for him, and then he ended up doing um, a few like really big Christmas movies that were like huge in the 90s. Like There was one called Prancer. <laughs> that was huge. Just yeah. about this little girl who finds Prancer in her backyard, and it was like a massive Christmas movie wow. in the 90s. Um and then he got nominated for um, best writing on one of his features, and so like he has a nomination and all this stuff. And what? Um, yeah, yeah, he's a he's a really cool dude. He's like pushing eighty, about to kick the can. Damn. And he's just like take, take this knowledge. He really is. Son. He's like he's like, dude, I've been directing for fifty years. Wow. He's like, I can tell you every story I've ever had, and I'll, I'm gonna just try to cram all this knowledge down your throat. Yeah. So what, what's a uh, top three pieces of advice he's, he's given you. If, um, if I can put you, if I can uh, be so bold as to put you on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think a, a lot of it is like, and, and you can really see this, like he is a really amazing director, but he has some like internal clock mm-hmm. that he feels. And so like, I was kind of going like seeing him every day when I was trying to raise all this money for Echo and he can, he can tell you just these small pieces of like, Hey, I got a guy wanting to invest 300 K. This is the situation. This is where he's from. This is how I met him. And John would be like, yeah, he's only going to do 150, but it's still 150. But I've been through this a million times. This type of person is only going to invest this much. Wow. And so like he has these things where he just knows instantly. The, the investor detective. Yeah. It, but even actor wise too, like I'd meet actors and they'd be kind of weird or they'd have a tick or they'd yeah. be kind of aggressive. And when I was like, man, this really isn't going to work. I didn't like his vibe. A lot of the time John would be like, yo, some of those guys have, the best instincts so just like kind of keep that in mind Mm -hmm. so kind of small things like that that he'd always kind of and then just in the like the directing space like he was uh he was my directing three and four professor Mm -hmm. and so he pretty much listens to every single conversation that you have with your actors because you know you're the you're guiding the boat and if you're not saying the right things, you're going to go the complete wrong way. Mm-hmm. And so just like hearing the recommendations of like, say it like this instead of this. Yeah. Word it differently. Just like approach them a little, a little bit more vulnerable from a director's standpoint. And they'll feel that. Mm-hmm. And that'll make them want to try it more. Can you, can you give an example of what uh, most directors say in the way that you should say it? Um, it, it shouldn't, yeah, it shouldn't be a direction at all. Yeah. It should, like everything you say, you should really, really mean and feel it. So like mm-hmm. if you need the character to be more vulnerable, you as a person need to talk to that actor more vulnerably explaining it because they'll feel that and know exactly what you want. Mm. So. Okay. That's yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It's kind of weird. So, so if I came to you, or like I'm, I'm the actor, and I'm, I'm doing something wrong. Like you, you want me to be more vulnerable or yeah, sad. Or if I'm just not feeling it. I think what it's just one say? of those things that you just have to go up to him and like, 
it's all about just genuine connection, you know? And if you go up to him and you say, man, I'm really not feeling this, and this yeah. is what I need because this character wants this, this, and this, and that's so important. Mm -hmm. They feel that, and they're like, yeah, yeah. dude, awesome. So you're, you're just kind of explaining the the whole the whole uh, umbrella situation to them so they, they grasp everything. Sure, and, and it can also be very specific things of like when you're doing that, I'm just not feeling it or I'm not believing it or it's coming across too big or it's coming mm -hmm. across too small. Like it really needs to be like grounded a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and, and you know, your, your relationship with every actor is completely different. Um, and some actors that I've worked with are like actors, you know, they're not going to be, they're not going to like, they're going to be superheroes. They're not like a Michael Shannon type actor. Yeah. And then you meet these young guys that are like Michael Shannon actors. And like there was one on echo who he's an actor that I'm crazy about. His name is Gillis Geary mm -hmm. where like majority of the time we didn't even have to talk. Like he would oh, do a wow. take and he'd look at me and I could just give him a hand gesture, just like, uh, like, and he'd be like, great, it needs to be longer. Got it. Cool. And he'd know exactly what I meant. And mm -hmm. he'd be like, don't, don't, I got it. I got it. Got it. Got it. Just go again. Yeah. And then I could do any gesture and he'd instantly get it just because he knew the character so well that just an expression did it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Wow. Um, that's awesome. There, there's so many, so many ways that I, I want to go with this. Yeah, conversation. sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you, you planted so many seeds there. Uh, I wish I could go all oh, at yeah. the same time. <laughs> um, so, uh, where, where do I want to go next? Can, can you talk about? I mean, working with Michael Shannon. I mean, that's mm -hmm. obviously a huge deal in, yeah. in my world, and I would imagine most people's worlds. Well, what's what's it like working with a, an actor that, you know, you've probably been watching for a decade? Right. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting too because um, Mike's just an interesting guy. Like, there's... He's hilarious. He is. He's yeah. fucking hilarious. Yeah. And, and, the, and the, the crazy and kind of nuts thing about it all is that, like, when you see him on Jimmy Kimmel and you see him on these other things, he's like the nicest dude in the world. And when he shows up on set, he is there to do one job. Yeah. You know, and he's there to kill it. And that's his only, like, he doesn't smile. He doesn't do any of that until he fucking needs to. It's like he saves his emotions for the scene. Wow. So, like, as soon as you say cut, he doesn't want to talk to anyone. He's just, like, in his zone. Damn. And then you, you go and say action again, and he brings all this just... Mm -hmm kind of gravitas to a scene that's just awesome wow and and another cool thing about him particularly is that like he's been doing this forever you know what i mean like mike's one goal is to be the best actor ever mm -hmm. that's it yeah like every day that's what he wants that's that and he works towards that every single day yeah. and so you know he's done 150 movies Jeez. right and i've done one <laughs> so like he doesn't have to listen to me like, yeah. like, what do I have to say that's going to make him a better actor? Right. Right? Yeah. And so the fact that, first off, he, every direction I gave him, sure, he'd question me on it and say, why do you want it like that? Why like this or whatever? But every single time he'd do it, which I thought was pretty respectable. Well, you probably stuck to your guns. Totally. And I yeah. knew the story better than he did. So, like, yeah. that's my motivation for it, you know? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, you just have to treat every actor differently because they all need something that's different. Mm -hmm. Like Michael Shane never wants to look at himself on playback. Really? Because it, it, he'll say, oh, I'm doing this wrong or oh, I'm doing this wrong when that's something that I could love mm. as a director. Yeah. So like if I'm seem, seeing something I don't like, then I explain it to him and he gets it and he changes it. Mm -hmm. But then there are other actors that want to, you know, they want to see themselves so that they can actually like physically change themselves. Yeah. So, That's... but Mike was great. Mike was really, really great. We worked long hours and I think we were working like 14 hour days. Damn. And 
actually his last scene. It was a night scene, eight characters in it. So we needed a massive amount of coverage. We probably shot for like six hours just on one scene. It was a five minute scene. It was just like as long as you could think. And, um, and uh, the last take, Mike came up to me and was like, hey, look, dude, I'm tired, exhausted. Do coverage on me one more time because it's going to be badass. That's going to come across and you're going to feel it. <laughs> it's like he could have just gone home. You know what yeah, I mean? But he didn't yeah. want to. Like he really, and wow. like he really enjoyed working with those kids because he started to see these, like he started to see Gillis and um, Jacob Alexander and Patrick Schwarzenegger. Like mm -hmm. he started to see like, yeah, these guys are approaching acting a different way than he does, but like it, there's something special, so. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Wow. That that's like so inspiring that it makes me want to like act. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you start to see how much of a craft it is. Too. Yeah. Like it's... Yeah. Well just that that uh Michael Shannon was like, Oh, I feel like shit. Like, let's roll now. Let's like I need to use this. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, Yes, I'm glad that I feel this way. Right. Yeah. Instead of just fuck this, I want to go home. It's yeah. like, yo, I'm gonna use this to make it better. Yeah. I and I feel I, I feel like there, there's so much self-awareness and vulnerability that goes with that. Like, like if you're feeling like shit, not feeling a hundred percent, like my first instinct is like, I need to go home before like these people think less of me. Yeah. 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 You totally. Know? Yeah. But an actor's like, no, like get this shit on film. Like, look, look at how much of a piece of shit I am. Film this. <laughs> right. 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 Which is great. But, and I think a lot of. I think that comes from him doing this a million times, you know? Yeah. Because when the young actors started to feel like shit, they were like, yo, let's go home. Mm -hmm. But, like, they didn't realize that that tiredness brought something to it. Yeah. It it brings authenticity. You can't you can't act tired. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can, but it won't. It's going to be, be shit. Real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's that's awesome, man. Yeah. So, I mean, was it was it intimidating? Like, yeah, he had Being dude. like, hey, uh... Mike, Michael, could uh, could we do that like one more time? <laughs> um, because he scares the shit out of me. Yeah. Um. You know he's he's really not. I mean he is an intimidating guy. Yeah. He's, you know six three and yeah. from Kentucky. You know he's just like yeah. And he has a he, he's just a he has all these little ticks that just kind of add to him as a person, not as a character. Yeah. And it's just so interesting. Mm -hmm. Um. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think if you just know your story enough, like, yeah. you know, I knew it was Michael Shannon, so I wasn't going to say something fucking stupid to him. <laughs> like if, if I had a direction, I knew I needed motivation for it yeah. and I needed to know how to explain that to him. Mm -hmm. Cause if I didn't, he would rip it apart Yeah. cause he's a ridiculously smart person, right. like unbelievably smart. He's one of those people, as soon as you talk to him, you can like get a sense of his intelligence. Yeah. And I think that comes across in his acting too. Like he knows mm -hmm. how to use that. And so like the notes that I had, I think were things that he's conscious of too. Like he doesn't always want to be painted as the bad guy. Yeah. And so if you can find that niche to kind of change his character to make him a little less just like this hard ass intimidating person mm -hmm. and give his character like another side. Then it, of course he's gonna be like fuck yeah let's do yeah, that you know yeah so he was cool um just just for my own sake can you give an example of a terrible note to give an actor because <laughs> i'm sure that i do that 24, yeah i mean i 24/7. think you know i get i kind of get down on myself for that too um because it's like your job as a director is finding the words to change something in the right way mm-hmm and like you're never gonna be perfect at that, you know what I mean? Never. I guess if you did it a million times, yeah. I mean that's what Martin Scorsese is, you know what I mean? There's yeah. a reason he's the best because he's done it a million times. Um, I don't, I don't know. That's a tough question. Yeah. Um, and I kind of treat notes very particularly, where you know a lot of people say don't give the actor the end result that you want. And I don't know if I really agree with that. I think mm -hmm. some actors need that. They need to know. Yeah, I need to get to here. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then, and then sometimes it's just as easy as like, if they're not getting it, take a five minute break. Mm -hmm. Just like chill out for five. Yeah. Um, but you know, like, you know, the, the, the things they tell you not to say is like, say, Oh yeah, I need more. Just give me more. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I'm not going to go, what? I'm not going to go up to Michael Shannon and be like, can you start acting now? That was a good take, but like try. Yeah. Mike. Right. Yeah. So uh, no condescension. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just a thing of just like, like I personally give every single note to that actor one on one. I don't want anyone to hear what I'm saying. It needs to be a, just a connection, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I read somewhere and I've, I've been right. I watch YouTube videos. I, I shouldn't say that I read. <laughs> Uh, I watched this YouTube video and the the director was saying like, yeah, don't don't tell the actor to be angry. Say like, you know, your dog just that guy just ran over your dog and he's not apologizing. Like, how does that make you feel? Like, elicit the response in them rather than just say, oh, be be horny now. Yeah, it's weird. Like, some people can really get that. Some yeah. people have like the result mentality where they're like, all right, I need to be angry. I need to think about an angry situation. Mm -hmm. some people can do that other people like need the like like they don't want to think about another situation they want the justification for it in the scene and if it's not there then they can't get there yeah which is great because if it's if it's not in the script it doesn't make fucking sense you know yeah right right yeah so so i guess uh, a good way to look at it is like the director needs to tell what kind of actor he's dealing with and how he needs 100 percent man how That's he needs to communicate everything and it's tough because like when you get on set you don't know what type of actors your actors are you mm -hmm. know you you kind of get a gauge yeah but like once you start rolling on takes and doing all that you start to realize that like like for echo they were just massively different actors across yeah. the board well they and, were different ages i mean yeah they were roughly between like 25 and 31 yeah so they were kind of in the same age then you bring in mike and we had another actress um who, who's a pretty big deal um her name's leslie ann warren and she was cinderella in the 60s and she was scarlet in the clue movie still smoking hot yeah yeah um and she's like 78 now yeah something crazy hell yeah um but she was amazing too because yeah. like it was that older kind of just like respected well-known actress yeah and she was like beautiful because like in the movie she's talking to these guys after they've already been caught and just trying to figure out their motivation mm -hmm. you know and she has this posture that's very beautiful and professional and the way she talks is you know she never curses and she has a well thought out response to everything they say mm -hmm. and then you have these kids that are like, yeah, fuck that. Fuck you. So it's like this beautiful contrast. Mm -hmm. So she was amazing too. She was, wow. and we worked her, man, shout out to her because she, we worked 15 hours that day. She's 78 years old. Jeez. You know what I mean? We were in this hot ass warehouse. It was disgusting. Wow. She did every take amazingly. So Damn. Um, did you guys get rehearsal time? Not with her. Not with her. Not with her. Not with Mike. Yeah. With everyone else we did. Yeah. So. How how long did you have uh Mike and, and Uh I Leslie we had for one day and Mike we had for three. Three days. So nice. on uh what ended up being a twenty six day shoot. Mm hmm So nice. That's awesome. Well, uh I, I wanna get back to the rest of your story. So yeah, yeah, sure. last last we left it, you were uh you had a dope ass reel with uh Kanye, Twista, yeah. R. Kelly in uh Columbia College, full ride, um, yeah. getting some dope ass mentors. What what next? Yeah, so um John Hancock, that professor, told me like you know, I made some decent short films, like nothing I'm proud of today. Mm-hmm. But he was like, dude, you just got to get that first feature out of your way. He's like, no one's going to see it. No one's going to give a fuck. Just get it out of the way. And, Amen. And, um, and, you know, I really started talking to him about stories and, you know, how to find that the right story. And 
and he was just like, look, man, 80% of riders are crap. That's the reality of it. So if you want to push through, you know, 100 scripts to find probably four that you'd actually consider, do it. You know, talk to an agency, get the scripts, go through them. He's like, or you just do it yourself. You just write it, figure it out, which he's like, that'll probably take three times as long. <laughs> um, and, uh, but he's like, dude, don't force anything. Like, unless you have a story, don't sit down and write because you're not going to write anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and then one day, fucking Echo Boomer slapped me in the face, man. I had a, did, have I told you the story? Uh, this is no. a really good one. How I found no. Echo. No, tell me about it. Oh, this is nuts. So I was living up in Andersonville, Mm -hmm. and my roommate came to me at the time, and he was just like, Seth, dude, last night I met these guys. You have to meet them. And I was like, why do I have to meet them? Like, so what? He was like, I went out with them. There are four of them. Um, We went out, and they spent like 10 Gs last night. But they're they're like, he's all right. They're like 22, 23 they're fun dudes. You got to meet them. Yeah. They want to go out again tomorrow. Come with us. And so I was like, all right, cool. So I go out and I meet these guys and they go to some douchey club and they spend like 15 G's. The bills come over. It's 15,000 bucks and they pay it like it was nothing. And I'd been hanging out with them all night. So I felt comfortable enough to ask the weird question like, hey man, like what do you do? And he like, I was thinking we're the same age. You dropped 15 K. What am I missing out on? You know what I mean? Like, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. Um, I'm a failure. Yeah. And he looked at me so sincerely and he was just like, Seth, my dad recently passed away. He gave me his business. Don't worry about it. Everything's on me. And he said it so sincerely that I was just like, yeah, cool. Um, and, uh, and so I started hanging out with them, and I hung out with them for about six months. And um, one Sunday morning, I got a call, like a voicemail from like a weird number. Um, and it was a voicemail from Chicago PD. They say, Seth Savoy, we have a warrant out for your arrest. You should come talk to us. And so... You're like, I will. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was scared shitless, yeah, you know what right. I mean? <laughs> um, and, uh, Prison, no thanks. But yeah. And... <laughs> So like I kind of, you know, when when you get a call like that, you're like kind of looking back at last night, and you're like, did I do anything fucked up? Like, <laughs> what happened? And um, and uh, so like you know, I had nothing to hide. So like I, I talked to a lawyer first, just to like smart man do that, and um, and I went to a you know like a police station and was just like, hey, got a weird voicemail this morning. What's up? And they were like, all right, yeah, let's go talk. And um, and so they bring me in this room and two people come in and they're like, do you know these guys? And I was like, yeah. And they show me pictures. I'm like, yeah, those are my fucking boys. What about it? And they kind of broke down to me what they were doing. Is they were um, Loyola University graduates and they couldn't get jobs because like 2012 just happened. And... Um, and so they started taking U-Hauls out to these really nice suburbs of like South Barrington and Lake Forest. And they'd just wait for people to leave their houses and they'd bust in and they'd steal as much as they could. Wow. And uh, they'd drop it off to a dude in the West Loop who would pay them 30 grand cash for everything they took. And they'd, they they ended up stealing like four Andy Warhols, six Picassos. Holy they were stealing shit. all the jewelry in the house. They were stealing passports. They were stealing everything they could get their hands on. Oh my gosh! Um, That's how much money is in the suburbs. Yeah, man. yeah, Good dude, God. it's crazy. Um, and so, yeah, it's it pretty nuts. And you know, they're splitting thirty grand four ways. You know, they're making seven k each. Yeah. For every house they hit. Wow. And they were doing it two to three times a week. Like they were doing it just like a crazy amount. Damn. They ended up hitting 350 houses before they got caught. Oh my God. Yeah. Just a ridiculous thing. And, um, how'd they get caught? Being stupid. Just thinking just that they'd around. never, yeah. Throwing money around thinking that they could do it forever. And, yeah. you know, um, 
And so they tell me this story and, you know, obviously my mouth drops and they're like, so you really didn't know they were doing this? And I was like, I swear to fucking God, dude, that is fucking crazy. Um, they never told me about any of that. And once they talked to the dudes, like they were like, yeah, we never told Seth anything. Um, but they had like pictures of me partying with them and like the whole deal, oh you know, because God. I was benefiting off stolen money, Yeah, yeah you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so so that happened, and I kind of looked at the story, and I started realizing, like, you know, obviously this is a story that I need to make. You know, yeah. it's ridiculous, and kind of it kind of hits you in the face. <laughs> yeah, it really did, and like it, it was also just an interesting thing of just like these kids had done what they were supposed to do. They got their degrees, waiting to get jobs. They got to the finish line, and nothing was there. Yeah. So they de- they decided to cheat the fucking system. Right. And that's how they felt when they were like yeah. going through all these houses. They felt like they were getting back at the people who told them to do something that didn't work. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it was, it was crazy. So I, I ended up taking a trip to Cook County Jail and I was visiting these guys. And, and you know, I was telling them that I was upset as a friend that um that they kind of put me in danger too yeah know? like i was well, upset a at that warrant out for your arrest yeah and if they w- could have found something that would have been like jail time yeah so um i was upset at that and i told them that and it's I lucky t- you weren't dating them if you were uh, oh dude i would have been their <laughs> boyfriend you'd yeah. be in jail <laughs> well, yeah yeah totally <laughs> and so like um so I told them I was really upset about that, but I'd forgive them if they gave me the rights to make it into a movie. Yeah. And they were well like, played. sure, take it. Yeah. You know? and, um, and it's funny. They all, they all ratted on each other as soon as they got caught. You know? Oh, really? And, and what was great, yeah. it's, it was, it's poetic how it all plays out because, you know, they're all about like, let's stick together. We're in this together, blah, blah, blah. And as soon as one gets caught, they're like, nope. I'll, I'll tell you everything you want to know. And it's just like, man. Um, so because that happened, they all confessed on each other and it was just a, kind of a shit show. Wow. They made it harder for themselves, you know. And um, because of that, when I was talking to them, they told me everything. And they were telling me the coolest things in the world. That yeah. like, at first they were just doing it to pay rent and to eat and to put gas in their car. And then it got to the point where like, money wasn't an issue. Like, it wasn't about the cash it was about the rush and the high of busting into these places yeah and um it's hard to match that with normal things in life yeah totally and i'll i'll never forget one of the guys looking at me on the other side of the glass and on the phone saying like what you go for first when you break into a house says everything about you it's like one of the guys had mommy and daddy issues he'd fuck up the family portraits and family pictures and um one of the guys uh uh, uh, leave it a message <clears throat> yeah like uh, one of the guys his his dad would beat the shit out of him when he was a kid and they were broke as shit so he never had any like toys or anything so the first thing he'd go to is he'd go to the kids room and he'd fuck up the kids room he'd draw an outline of the parent on the wall with crayons and he'd bust the head out so it's just like these things that like really tell you about their past mm-hmm. and um and once they started telling me all that i was like Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pause, um. <laughs> pause for dog vomit. <laughs> yeah. um, so you were wrapping up Echo Boomers. Uh, yeah. Your buddies were ratting on each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and like once you hear those crazy stories like that, you just realize that it, it was so many people can relate to feeling cheated, especially in our generation, you know? Yeah. Um. And I'd never buy the boomers. Yeah, buy the boomers. <laughs> and uh Okay, boomer. And it it was just I don't know, it just kind of worked out it and I never like the film definitely I mean for the first 30 minutes it kind of glorifies millennials. Yeah. And then the last hour and a half it's just like look at these dumb fucks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so it's, there's like a cool thing to it. So like for the yeah. first 30 minutes, you're like, man, this is actually kind of badass. Yeah. And then the rest, you're like, no, they're actually just horrible people. Yeah. Um. 
and so yeah once that happened I, I wrote it into a script and it took pretty much two years to write mm-hmm. and then I took it to Sundance in 2015 and um, I had a crap scammy uh, lawyer from mm-hmm. Chicago, I won't mention his name, but um, <laughs> he. Uh, we'll tag him in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. Um, he uh, he ended up reading it and was like, "Hey, man, you know, I can I can get you into one of these Sundance script competitions, and mm-hmm. let's just kind of see how it does." And um, he got me in, and and we ended up winning. So wow, yeah, that's awesome. That was cool for the. I mean, it's a feature length script, so it was for the feature length yeah, script. Yeah, they have um, they have like a a a script slash pitch competition where they read them, they pick the top twenty, and then whoever can pitch theirs the best, mm. they end up giving an award to. Wow! So, yeah. So so tell us about this uh, this nailed pitch. Uh, I mean, all it was was exactly what I gave you. Oh yeah, that was it. Just the the story, just the story, and yeah. kind of how it happened and all that stuff. Nice. Um, but um, but yeah. So once that happened, it, it was kind of weird. I mean, you, you kind of get offers from different producers and all this stuff, and I mean, they were great offers. Um, mm-hmm. but every single one of them wanted to rip my name off because I was a first time guy. You know, yeah. they don't. You know, they think it's great, but they don't know if I can direct or not. You know what I mean? Right. And I get that. Um, and so we ended up getting probably four or five different offers and they they just didn't work. You know, as, as much as I wanted to work with some of the producers that were throwing those offers out there, mm-hmm. they, they just didn't have faith in me, you know? And so I wanted to find people that really believed in it on a different level than just, man, this is good. Let's make it happen. Like I I want to be with people who want me to be the head of it. And I didn't find that at Sundance. You know, I found people who just wanted to buy it. Yeah. Um, so money, I ended, money it, people. Yeah. So I ended up telling them no. <clears throat> and there was probably like a year where I thought that was like the worst decision ever. No way. For sure. Because no one wanted to do anything with it. Wow. You know? Um, until you get into the right circle and, and eventually I met this producer and a, and a good friend of mine now named Sean Kaplan. I met him at Soho House, like literally like bumped into him and we started talking and he was like, Oh, you got a script. Cool. Yeah. Let me read it. And, uh, I was like, yeah, sure. Go for it, man. And, um, he ended up being one of Michael Shannon's producers and he gave the script to uh Michael Shannon's manager who's named Byron Wetzel and um and yeah and that's kind of how it all happened wow and then I got a call from Byron he was like hey let's meet tomorrow I'm in Ch- I'm in Chicago and then he met me and he's like I'm Mike's manager I can get Mike on this project Mike loves it I love it I think you're great I'll rep you and I was like, yeah, why Damn, not? Yeah. Dude. So, so once it was crazy, cause that probably happened in a week, you know, there'd been like a year of just kicking yourself, having a crap, a crap, um, uh, casting director on board who eventually, you know, didn't work out. We got a new one mm-hmm. who they're amazing, but there was a period there where we had pretty much no one on the film, like producers that were like kind of weird and, um, not really finding money and not really able to put it all together. And then once I brought Byron and Sean on board, we kind of cleared house and kind of started from fresh and Mm -hmm. it was nice. Damn. Well, uh, if ever there was a story, fortune favors the bold. I would, I would say that, you know, yeah. Um, like how, how did you know that, um, that these weren't the right people you you wanted to be on the project these producers were offering you money and they were willing to buy the scripts but you wanted to be on it how how did you know that you're like I'm going to stick to my guns here because the story was so good yeah cuz when you look at that script and what everyone was saying so you're like man I haven't read a story this good in 5 years <laughs> well then 
I know that there's a massive value to it then. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? If you've been searching for a story like this and haven't found it in five years, then I know I have something special. Yeah. And if you're not going to figure out the money and let me do it, someone else will for sure. Mm -hmm. Especially if I attach Michael Shannon to it. Yeah. I mean, that's what really brought it home. Right. You know, it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have happened without that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so those producers like really believed in me and and really um made it happen. Mm -hmm. So it was cool. Wow, and and it's all a matter of just randomly running into someone. That's it. Really is, man. <laughs> it really is. Another thing too that this is hilarious. Um, Byron and Sean were a big part, but another big part was that I had a pretty sizable investment uh, that I had from this guy in Chicago, mm -hmm. and. It's so funny, like how it all happens. Like I had a friend who I met at Spring Awakening because I used to shoot Spring Awakening oh, as yeah. like a videographer. I thought you meant partying there. <laughs> yeah, that would have been cooler. Um, I had this friend who, you know, he, we became pretty good friends. And um, this was probably like four years ago now. But she came to me and was just like, hey, Seth, I'm hanging out with these cool guys. You should just come on down. And I'd only hear for, from her like, you know, once every three months or so. But she'd say, hey, these guys are cool. You got to meet them. Come on out. And for some reason, I decided to do it. And um, we went to this really, really, really shitty dive bar called The Shop. And it's on like Belmont. So it's like dirty. There's like glass on the floor. It's like disgusting. Um and she introduced me to these two guys who those two guys now are like my, some of my best friends in the world but they were in the very back of this bar playing pop a shot like the game where you put 50 cents in and the and the basketballs roll down and oh, you yeah. just kind of see how many and uh these guys were like into it and i went up to him and i said hey i bet 10 bucks i can beat your score next round and he's like you're fucking on and uh and you know they're probably 40 years oldish and um, we just, you know, kind of got drunk and played pop shot and through like seeing him again and again and again, he kind of like heard about kind of what I did and who I was. And he was like, dude, let me read your script. And then he came back to me. He's like, yeah, I'll invest. I'll give him <laughs> done. That sounds awesome. I'm in. Wow. And so because of that, it gave us capital to actually make things happen. Yeah. Like Byron and Michael Shannon's team got a real casting director on board. Her name's Allison Estrin. She does the show uh, Billions. Mm. Um, she's great. She's My mom loves that show. Yeah. She, she, it's an unbelievable show. But um, we were able to do that and then actually send out real offers. You know? Mm -hmm. like she didn't send out 100K offers that we could actually escrow money for. You know what uh. I mean? Um, and so, yeah, it was cool, man. If I would have mm. never went to that random bar and talk to dudes yeah. playing papa shot that would have never happened you it, know it almost seemed like you you had a direction and you had a vision and then you just you're like i'm just gonna keep going this way until something the, happens the yeah. dominoes fall in place yeah for yeah, me yeah. and that what you're describing is those dominoes falling in place yeah 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 which um is awesome yeah it, it's cool it, it felt very serendipitous yeah you know yeah. Um the the universe was conspiring to Right, to right, right. Make this I movie mean, happen. You know, if you think about it, like every day and you pass someone who can help you get to where you want to go. Mm -hmm. It's just you have to be like, you know, vocal enough and friendly enough to be at the right place at the right time. Hang, hang out in the sauna at uh That's so house yeah. for, for hours. <laughs> yeah. The, the sweaty butthole of solo house yeah. for an hour. <laughs> Preferably uh, right after they clean it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's awesome. So, so, I mean, there were there were a couple of big turning points. You you got connected with uh, someone who connected you with with Michael, and then you found uh, some money. What was that? That wasn't the full budget. That it wasn't. It was um. It was about a sixth of the budget. Sixth. So of the budget. It, was, it was about five hundred k. Okay. Cool. So. Which is enough to like really get the ball rolling. Any, mm -hmm. Anything lower than that wouldn't have been enough. Right. But, um, yeah, yeah, that's kind of and and I know that Byron and Mike wouldn't have really hopped on unless I was real in there, mm -hmm. ready to spend. Yeah. So, yeah, it kind of wow. worked out. And and 
these investors were sold uh, based on obviously meeting you and then reading the script, which resonated with them. Yep. And that the, was it. And that, yeah. and that first guy who's one of the main producers and he's a, one of my best friends in the world and a badass. Um, his name's James Langer. He, um, he became a head producer of it and, um, really started pushing it along and eventually it happened and mm -hmm. he invested with no actors involved wow he just thought that it was badass he knew it was gonna happen it's only a matter of time damn and um i think he's crazy for thinking that but i think he, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think he put his money on the right horse on this one yeah so nice damn dude that's awesome um and had he ever produced anything before Nothing. Yeah. He never produced a single thing. Wow. But he knew he wanted to get into it and he knew I think he had a gut instinct. He knew that like I was going to make this happen no yeah. matter what. And I was gonna make it happen on a level that I was happy with. Mm -hmm. And uh yeah, eventually it got there somehow. Nice. It got there. That's awesome, man. Crazy story. I, I feel I'm I'm waiting for it to come out that this guy got his money through ill begotten <laughs> means yeah. and then you just make the sequel yeah right <laughs> <laughs> um that's great so uh so you got the money you got michael shannon um and then there was the casting process which yeah. is just kind of nuts i mean mm -hmm. it's probably my least favorite part of the business um but um yeah you know we had we had a ton of actors it's all politics, you know, like casting is politics. Yeah. Like, you know, Mike's at CAA, so other agencies will help to try to get on Mike's good side, to get him over to their agency, or mm -hmm. just to for him to be another part of a, another project. Or, And so, like, you, like, that's their MO. Like, agents are, you know, very, a, a very specific type of person. Make money off of someone else. Mm -hmm. So like every single transaction that they make is to better themselves in some way. And so it's just funny when you show up at agencies and they're like, oh my God, I love this script so much. It's so amazing. Blah, 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 blah. It's like, dude, you're fucking helping us because Mike's in it. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. Like, just be real. I get it. I understand the game. <laughs> like, just don't <laughs> bullshit me. Um, yeah. And, um, and so there was a lot of that, a ton of that. Like we had so many actors involved that were like great choices, but it's just like, it's all a game. Like mm -hmm. you give them something, they give you something, it's a trade off. Um, so eventually it kind of all happened, but mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Um, and it sounds like you have some really sort of exciting and uh, awesome young up and coming actors yeah yeah well, well we have uh patrick schwarzenegger who we we took a chance on and i'm really happy that we did it um it's good to meet his dad <laughs> he, he did show up on set no and, way, his, that's and awesome. his mom yeah they wow. did. and they were awesome they were so polite and so yeah. amazing um but um you know patrick had done majority love films like high school sappy just like not my type of movies and it's not what echo is you know what i mean yeah. like these kids are doing drugs and busting into places and like living life to like a dangerous maximum all the time yeah, yeah. um and uh so i didn't know if patrick would be into it since he hadn't done a movie like that i just didn't know if like maybe he's just doesn't want to be associated with this stuff or whatever and mm -hmm. we sent him an offer and he loved it he was like dude this is sweet let's do it um and uh and so yeah we we ended up going with patrick and i i hadn't really seen patrick's acting capabilities because since he'd only done high school love stuff mm -hmm. and there's kind of been this hiatus in his career for the past like four years just because he wanted to get better at acting mm -hmm. so he'd taken all these classes and all this stuff and so it's hard to gauge his acting ability off of his past work and um, so once he got there and we started rehearsing, you just started to see, like, he had some chops on him. You know, he'd done his homework. He's done research. He he was, like, in it. Mm. And 
So to be able to like depict Patrick this way for the first time, I think people are going to love it. Awesome. Um, yeah, so we have Patrick. We have uh, Alex Pettifer, who's the guy from Magic Mike and I Am Number Four. And, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we have him, who he's he's a really interesting dude. I mean, everything that he everything he's in, he brings such a charisma to. And even when you meet him, he captivates you the way he talks. And he's just kind of this mesmerizing character. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was a producer on the film, too. And he, and he was amazing. And then... Um, who else do we have? We have a uh, Gillis Geary who Gillis is a kid that went to Juilliard and is just amazing. It's just incredible. Damn. He's going to, and this film, he's one of the main characters in this one and he plays this beautifully slimy character so well. <laughs> um, and he kills it. And, and then once this comes out, I'm sure it'll be booked on everything. Wow. Um, and he takes his craft so seriously. Um, and then we had two more. We had Oliver Cooper, who was in, uh, he was recently on Mindhunter. He was one of the bad guys in Mindhunter. Uh, he was in 21 and Over, that movie where like oh, just a kid's party. Yeah. I enjoyed that movie probably more than I should have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was one of the kids. He was like kind of the chunkier dude with like curly hair. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we ended, who's the last one? Then we had Haley Law, who she was on Riverdale. Okay. And, you know, she was just kind of happy to get out of that genre mm-hmm. of Riverdale just because it's kind of high schoolish. And. Yeah, that, that seems to have a pretty low ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you can do. And so, and it, that's how she felt, you know. She yeah. felt like she just wanted to get into stuff that's a little bit more gritty, a little bit more indie. Yeah. Just like stuff that's real. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and she read it. She read it beautifully. And, um, I'm really glad I casted her because she kills it. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So, I mean, obviously this is a, an independent production. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Are you paying full rates like they're going rate? Or are you able to sort of no, I mean, you def- I mean, what is a going rate? I have know? no idea. Yeah, like <laughs> I was a, hoping you'd know. A going rate is how badly the actor wants to do that project. Yeah. That's what a going rate is. Mm-hmm. If it's a studio movie, those, like I said, those agents know the game. Yeah. They know everyone exactly what they're going to pay they know it um and so a lot of them we just went to him and said look this is what we have well we can give you some points and you know however much that's it can't go any higher this is an indie movie what else do you want Mm -hmm. and um all of them were great all of them were pretty reasonable about it yeah. Um, but and it, yeah and it was i mean it was the the reason they want to do it they read the script they love it and then they meet you and they know it's in good hands right and then they're like and then normally you know they they look at the actors that are going to be around them mm-hmm. and they're like cool leslie and warren michael shannon and then some people in their age range that are pretty respectable then like great mm-hmm. that sounds awesome yeah so so you really i mean the tipping point kind of like jumps in my mind like you you got the manager introduced you to michael shannon he said yes and then the investor well i guess the investor was even before that so you got the money got the manager got michael shannon and then it was like oh shit this is tipping over to where it's kind of doing it itself yeah yeah so once we had alex patrick and mike because we didn't have leslie at, at the time mm-hmm. um those three pretty much got us. Um, Universal came to us and said, "Hey, you know, if you make a good movie, we'd love to buy a percentage of your um, distribution rights." Mm-hmm. And a few company, a few other companies came in, but it pretty much ended up being about half of the film's budget um, was just kind of pre-sale, pre-selling international. Um, and then we already had a sixth of it from one of the investors. And then it was just kind of like a slow, you know, kind mm-hmm. of slow creep of other people coming in for like short money. Like you're never going to find your budget from one person ever. So mm-hmm. it was pretty much like an accumulation of, you know, 100K here, 100K here, 100K here. Were, were these friends, family, industry folks? Industry folks. I mean, yeah. a lot of them were 
people trying to get into the industry and yeah. wanted their name on something that had actors because right. like films like this rarely happen. Well, this is, I mean, I would say this is a prestige film. Like this isn't like a straight to video. It's not, it, it'll, it'll have a, it'll have a theater run for sure. Yeah. hundred percent. But, um, but it could not have like if, if it was a bad movie, then yeah, that's exact. I mean, that's the reality of it. Yeah. If it's a bad movie, you're not going to get in theaters. Right. Right. That's that no matter who you have in it. Yeah. Um, and I think people are starting to see, even though we're only on our second cut, people are starting to see like, even through these cuts, like, of course it needs to be trimmed and it needs to be shorter and all the normal notes you get, mm-hmm. but like it's getting there. Yeah. And once it is there, people are going to love it. Sweet. So, that's um, awesome. Yeah. So a lot of them just kind of read the script and then they met me and then they saw the cast and they were like, yeah, cool, let's do it. Mm-hmm. So what what was the timeline from you? Okay, so you, you win the Sundance competition, you get a bunch of offers, you turn them all down, you wait a year of just kind of like... Trying to make it work without... Being really? angry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, okay, so from the time you got... The one six budget, five hundred K and Michael Shannon, when did you go into production? Like how long was that? Was that like two years, three years? Um let me think. It happened we shot in August of two thousand and nine. Mm-hmm. Two thousand nineteen. Two thousand nineteen, yeah. Um and then uh I guess I met Byron in 2017. So there was two years in between getting Mike and then being wow. on set. Oh my God. But a lot of that was just casting. Yeah. You know, like we had a ton of actors involved. Mm-hmm. Like at one point we had Theo James. At one point we had Nick Robinson. At one point we had Britt Robertson. Like there are all these people that, just off of the timing of it, because you got to get someone on board. And then once you get that person on board, you have to go to investors and, you know, companies and studios and make it happen. Mm -hmm. And in between that time, people find other stuff, you know, and I totally get it. It's part of the game. Um, So that was like a big thing that of just finding the right people that really want to do it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that took some time, you know, just because casting is such a give and take. Um, but yeah, we eventually got there. So it was it was actually the casting that was the biggest uh, sort of time suck. Yeah, that, uh, for sure. Yeah. That that was hands down the biggest time wow. time suck. So, yeah. I guess, I guess just coordinate like e- like even finding the right people that takes forever. But then being like, cool, when can all of these planets and stars align that we can shoot this at the right, same time? Right. And and it was funny too because like some people um some people that we had like they wanted to do it, but they only wanted to do it if it happened this month. Uh, so if it happened another month, they wanted to do a different project then. Right. And like just the way it works like you really have to want to do it. Mm-hmm. Like it's never going to happen when you think it's going to happen. Right. No way. Yeah. Like people take forever to transfer money. <clears throat> it takes forever just to make a deal with them because it's such this, like, you know, they ask around and you know, you don't want to tell anyone your budget while you're mm-hmm. casting people because if they know your budget, then they're going to bump their price up. Right, right. So it's like a constant. They ask around. They try to find out as much as possible from you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just takes forever. Yeah. That's the sad fact of it. Unless you have like, unless you've built those relationships with people. Mm-hmm. Because like once I started to have a personal relationship with these actors, like Patrick and... um and Gillis and Alex Pettifer, like once you can just call them on the phone and say, hey man, this is what's going on. Are you cool with this? And they're like, yeah, cool. That's that. Like that's what makes the progression happen nice. so quickly. So what, how, how did you go about developing those relationships? Yeah, so like normally um, what would happen is, you know, their, my manager and their agent would say, yeah, you know, they love the project. And Byron would say, Seth is going to be in L.A. next week. Let's make him have a sit down. 
And so we'd, you know, meet at a bar and have a beer and just kind of hang out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And majority of the time, they'd just, you know, they're cool. They thought I was cool. And it's like, yeah, dude. I'll text you if I need anything. That's that. Yeah. Because, like, everyone nice. knows that. So being a human. Yeah, just being a normal person. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, everyone knows that agents play dirty games. And if you can kind of work around that, then yeah. it's. And what's funny, too, is we had so many problems with actors. And then I'd just call them. They'd be like, wait, what's happening? <laughs> what? Wow. No, nah, dude, it's all good. That's that. And then you can go back to the agent and say, hey, fuck you. I just called them. That's not happening. Wow. So stop trying to be a problem. Damn. You know? Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how that worked out. That's great, man. Um, so then uh, you guys have all the cast nailed down. You have a production date nailed down. Um, can you tell me about like your process and, and kind of like choosing the, the key crew members and pre-production shot list? Uh, yeah. Um, it's, it's, you know, first off, I want to say it's amazing that any movies get made right? ever <laughs> because, you know, there are just so many egos and yeah. so many crazy people that you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. But, um, but a lot of it is, is I think I'm really against settling on things. And I drove my producers crazy mm -hmm. because, you know, they'd find me a hospital and I'd be like, well, it looks like shit. So I'm not going to shoot here. <laughs> find me another, you know? Yeah. Um. So that was like a really big thing that the producers thought I was just crazy. But now that we have a film, I can show them why that other one wouldn't have worked. Mm -hmm. And and like a lot of people kind of look at it in different aspects of like some producers are there to get a movie done then other producers are there to help the director. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so obviously I clashed pretty hard with the people <laughs> that were just there to get it done. Right. Because I can I can do that. I'm not worried about that. I need producers yeah. that are going to help me with exactly what I want. Mm -hmm. Um. And so there's a lot of clash on that, but eventually they kind of got the style and the flow of exactly what I needed and how long I needed every day. Um, and eventually we got there, but I mean, shooting's never like a easy, just like flow. Like there's always something going on that's going yeah. on and there's always, it's just like managing people more than anything. Yeah. Um, like I said to you during one of our breaks, uh, God apparently hates filmmakers cause yeah. it seems like on set, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's pretty nuts. Yeah. Um, but, but for me personally, what I did that helped me a lot, um, in terms of shot list was, <clears throat> and I encourage every filmmaker that hears this to do this. Um, but I pretty much took my script and everyone always asks for lookbooks, right? They're like, oh, do you do you have a lookbook of what your film's going to look like? And I was just sick and fucking tired of that question. <laughs> like, yeah, sure, I'll go on fucking Pinterest and pull together yeah, what it's going to look like. a mood board. Yeah, if that's what you want, fine. Put some uh, engagement rings in there. Yeah. And it was, ideal dress. It, right. It's whatever. And so I got that so often. I was just like, all right, I'm going to do this so well. That it's going to be embarrassing for when people <laughs> ask. And so what I did was I took every single scene. And after a scene, I put a lookbook for composition, style, color, um, moods, uh, camera movements, everything. After every single scene. So like you read scene one, you flip the next page, you have a mood board. Mm -hmm. You flip another page, you have scene two. Flip it again, you have the lookbook for scene two. Mm -hmm. So you can like literally see the movie as you're going through it. Wow. Um, and so that helped a lot because a lot of them were just like pretty much basic, basic shots that I had in my mind, whether it was just like a, a squared up center shot or, you know, an extreme wide that you can like grab inspo from other films. And so when you're with your DP, you just slap down that sheet of paper and say, that's it. That's mm -hmm. what I want. Yeah. They're like, great, cool, got it. <laughs> yeah, you can't communicate much more visually than a picture of exactly what you want. Right. And so if you kind of do your research and 
you know exactly what you want, then it's great Mm -hmm. because you can literally just point at it instead of trying to explain what you want for 10 minutes. You just point at it. Great. Can can you talk about the the research process of figuring out what you want? I mean, that was tough. It's, you know, you watch 150 films and you pause it and you <laughs> screenshot it and <laughs> that's it. <laughs> how, how did you know which movies to watch? It's weird because like when you think about it, like you've seen the movies that you, you, like you're inspired from your script from, you know, uh-huh. you just have to really think about it. You know, if you want an extreme wide then in the desert or something like that. Well, then you go to a casino where they're driving through the desert. And it's an extreme wide. Like there are those things that you're like, oh yeah, I remember it from this movie. Mm-hmm. Or like a shot where they're all backlit, like Spring Breakers. Great, yeah. got it. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, Such an underrated I, classic, in my opinion. Do, I think uh, Harmony Kareem is a really cool yeah. filmmaker. He's he does stuff that's nuts yeah i'm sure his producers are like this doesn't make fucking sense <laughs> but like once you see it you just connect to it you yeah. know yeah yeah uh, there's beauty behind it yeah and his dp is just like amazing you know he knows how to make it just unbelievable yeah um but yeah and then once you kind of get into that mode mm-hmm. of like all right i need you know 10 photos for this lookbook or, or for the scene then like you start looking for them everywhere Mm. every you know if you're watching game of thrones and you see a beautiful shot of exactly you're like dude that's exactly what i'm talking about you pause it you screenshot it how how long did that process take Mm, it probably took about a month yeah which i can send you what it looks like because it's cool dude i'd love to see that yeah it's really cool yeah um that's awesome how now how did you find your uh dp your um line producer first ad yeah the, um the key key personnel yeah I, I was kind of bullied is the wrong word but because someone was bringing in a, a pretty good amount of the budget and some financiers he was just like look man i want to use my people that i've used before mm-hmm. just meet with them talk with them if you don't like them we'll find someone else um and uh and I love my AD. Her name is Sazzy. And, you know, Saz like, she's... An AD is someone that is, like, in a very weird position. Yeah. Because they have to hurry. Every, everyone hates the AD, you know? <laughs> yep. And that's the that's the truth of it. Yep. Um, and I don't deal very well with people telling me I'm going to do something. Mm-hmm. I just don't. You, ch- you chafe with authority. Yeah. I preach it, brother. I'm the same way. Yeah. And if someone says, well, you have 10 minutes left to shoot the scene, I'm going to say, well, I'm going to shoot it until I get it right. So <laughs> what do you want me to say? Yeah. Um, and Sazzy and I had a really cool relationship. She she got very quickly what I was doing from a filmmaking perspective. And she got very quickly what I was doing with the actors that kind of brought out these emotions and she started to realize like there was one instance which the scene ended up beautiful anyways but um i didn't have enough time to get it perfect and sazzy saw that Mm -hmm. and she realized like if she put more pressure on me it just wasn't going to work like um and uh and yeah so so we had a really really great relationship and my dp is this guy named carlos verone and um, he's a he's a true artist, and uh, I actually saw a kind of a lifestyle commercial that he did for Free People, the clothing brand. And I'd been sent all these DPs, and I just kind of thought like I didn't want to have to explain to someone what I thought beautiful was. Mm. So I started looking at all these reels and I was thinking, if my film looks like this, would I be happy with it? If I pause their reel at any moment, do I think that's a beautiful frame? Mm. And um, and with Carlos's, every single time I paused it was an absolutely beautiful frame. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of how Carlos happened and 
Carlos is just kind of a very intense Argentinian. That's like six <laughs> three. Um, but yeah, it worked out with him. And then um, my line producer, I honestly didn't talk to very much just because they were kind of buffers. Like mm -hmm. producers would go and talk with it, figure it out. So I didn't really get to talk to the line producer much. And um, yeah, man, that's it's probably for the best. You don't want to be answering to too many people. Yeah, and and um, that that our line producer's name was Charles Berg, and um, you know I didn't. He didn't need to talk to me, and I didn't need to talk to him. And it's just such an intense environment. Mm -hmm. It's actually nice. To just be like, cool, I know Charles got my back, I got his, but there's no reason to sit down every day and talk about numbers. Like, that's not going to help me make this movie better. So. Right, right. That's awesome. I'm, I'm noticing a, uh, there's a through line in this story, and it's you sticking to your guns. Hmm. You know what you want, and you're not going to um, fold for anyone, no matter how sort of easy out this option would be. Sure, sure. Um, yeah. Do you do you know where that comes from? Do you know. have a mentor that kind of? I don't know. That's a really good question. Yeah. Um. It's funny too because there were tons of times while we were shooting that there were easier options. Mm -hmm. And it's tough because it's not like you can go back and see if that easier option would have worked. Yeah. You know, maybe I was just being too stubborn. <laughs> but um. Well, I'm a I'm a Kubrick disciple, so you know, short of 120 takes, I'm I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's weird too because I feel like what I was asking for in majority of these situations, like, I'm an extremely logical dude. Yeah. I I'm not asking for like, you know, a 20 foot crane with, you know massive lights attached to it and all this stuff yeah. like, that's not what explosions. i want explosions yeah that's not what i want i want yeah. just want it to be as real as possible um and eventually they got that there was a little pushback but once i started physically showing them like all right i'm going to show you what this location looks like with a camera mm -hmm. and i'm going to show you it sucks ass <laughs> and i truly believe that like locations are one of the most important things a filmmaker can figure out really Oh, a hundred percent, man. Hmm. Like if you have a location that shoots itself, like the audience will be mesmerized just by the location for half of the scene, yeah. even if the acting's crap, you know what I mean? <laughs> like they'll see something, they'll be like, dude, that looks unbelievable. Yeah. So how did you guys find the best locations? I was obnoxious and I told them, you know, I want 20 options for every location. Mm-hmm. We're at a hospital, show me 20 hospitals. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we'll find one that I like. Just give yeah. me the options. Don't give me two options. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of what we did was we probably had like just a month or so of just scouting places every day. Wow. And and sometimes, you know, I'd walk into the first one and be like, dude, this is perfect. Great. Yeah, yeah. I don't need to see any more. This mm -hmm. is it. Lock it down. Yeah. Um. So yeah, and and I just feel like if you if you look through them enough, you're gonna find them. Yeah, it just comes down to like finding those people that are in your group that really trust you, and say, dude, I'll show you 50 hotels if that's what it takes. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's and it's hard because you got to keep those people motivated. And, yeah, you know, and everyone wants to be a part of the process and appreciate it, and just like the small things. Yeah, and after the 25th hospital. <laughs> You know, they kind of get exhausted. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and and did you guys shoot in Illinois? We shot in Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City. We did, I think, three days in Chicago, two in L.A., 22 in Salt Lake. Do, do they have, like, a boner of a tax credit? Um, they were great, man. They um, Sorry, it's... terrible phrasing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they're great. Uh, their film commission there is extremely friendly. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's where Sundance is. That yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Extremely friendly. And, um, and then they get their tax credit back like almost instantly. 
So like, it's not like Chicago here where you got to wait a year and Mm -hmm. you get it back and then you got to sell it to someone and you only get 90% of it and all those kind of weird things. Mm -hmm. Salt Lake has figured that out. I mean, they choose you. I think they only choose like six or seven like bigger films and they choose Mm -hmm. however many indies below that. Oh yeah. Um, But they were great. They yeah. were unbelievable, and and just like the the support of that community, Salt Lake is extremely friendly. And we actually had um, Amy Redford show up on set one day. That's his daughter. Yeah, that's cool. Redford's daughter, and she was so nice. She was wow. so amazing, and just she was kind of blown away just by what we were doing. So she was yeah. great. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome, man. So you got all the pre production done. Um, now you're in production. Can you tell me about that process? Yeah, it's tough because, because like, you know, going through production is like trying to be a well-oiled machine together. Yeah. When you haven't worked with people before, it's really hard to get on the same page, especially when it comes to shooting, because like a lot of people have a lot of different terms for things. So like the DP and I. Like, I'd say I'd want a very specific... Like, his definition of a medium and my definition of a medium was just a little off. Yeah. So, like, when I say that's what I wanted, you know, he'd be a little bit closer than I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And so it was just, like, trying to figure out what everyone means when they say a term like that. Mm -hmm. Even a close-up, you know? Like, sure, some people think that it's, you know, from here, but some people think it's from here. And it's just, like, these small things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it took a while to get on the same page with everyone. Um, and, and the way that some crews work and some crews, you know, a lot of camera assistants really want their, um, want their run throughs, right? Like their rehearsals. They really want it just so that they can like nail it. And, and for me, I really don't like to like, I let's just do a take. If you're going to go through it, so what? If you fuck up, you fuck up. That's fine. We'll yeah. just do it again. Yeah. But like, not why not just get another take in the can? The yeah. actor's ready. Right. And I, and I know that may Options, sound... Options, baby. Yeah. Yeah, and I know that may sound stubborn because the AC just wants to do his job correctly. Mm-hmm. But dude, if you're going to have to walk through it anyways, just record it. <laughs> yeah. Um, if the actors are ready, then let's do it. Yeah. Um, and even looking at it, you know, looking at all the takes and stuff like that, it's kind of like... Um, I'm glad we did that. You know, I'm glad that Mm -hmm. we rolled on those rehearsals and yeah, because it just gives you options. Mm -hmm. So did you, you did mention that you had some rehearsals before production starts. We did. We had some rehearsals in terms of just the actors and with the crew, like obviously we'd have like a a tech scout Mm -hmm. and they'd, you know, figure out where all the lighting was going to go. And I'd take them through exactly the movements and where it's going to happen. And, um, and yeah, so, so it was cool. It's just, sometimes they want, you know, that camera movement to be perfect. And a lot of it was like working with the Steadicam op, Mm. like those Steadicam ops, they have a rough job (laughs) for sure. Yeah. Um, so it was just kind of getting them, explaining to them the movement that you want. Yeah. Because we had shots where, like, um, the uh, the actors were, like, running from a house towards the camera, like, in slow motion. And the and the steady cam would have to... We had one of those moving trucks with, like, the metal, uh, like, slide that kind of hits the ground. Mm-hmm. And so he'd be, he'd be um, in front of him. And then he'd have to go up that ramp backwards and go into the truck... So that like they could all jump in two and then shut the gate and they go to black. So like it was just really complicated moves. That it wow. just those just take time. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So yeah. Damn. Um, that's awesome. Um, and you you can you tell me like how long you rehearsed with the actors for and like what how that helped the inevitable uh, production. Yeah, I mean, mainly the rehearsals were just for me more than anyone. Yeah. Because I needed to know how well that they had processed their characters. Mm-hmm. And the rehearsals were great because I could realize that they'd all done their ho- homework and they were all professionals and it was great. Um, 
but once you get on set, I mean, that rehearsal is pretty important. That blocking is like everything, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes it just takes a minute to figure out. And so what I did majority of the time is I would shoot for the day and then, you know, you pretty much have 12 hours before you start again. And so I'd spend like probably an hour to an hour and a half just looking at the next day, drawing out that location and figuring out that blocking mm. so that when I got there, I'd know exactly where it needed to be. Mm. Okay. So blocking, you didn't, you didn't do that uh, like well before production. You were like, well, we I mean, got we, the location we tried to, we tried, we tried to yeah. do as much blocking as possible. Yeah. But like, as long as the location looked beautiful and it was visually pleasing, I'll figure out the blocking. Yeah. It was, it was more about just like, will this location work mm -hmm. in terms of just where everything is and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so yeah, I guess my, my question is like, you know, what, what do you absolutely need to do in pre-production so that you feel comfortable for production? Like, it sounds like you can kind of, you can figure out blocking while you're there. Well, sometimes you don't have the location. There are probably five yeah. or six locations that we didn't have until we were shooting. Oh, wow. Like that week one, the producers were working on locations for week four. Mm -hmm. So while you're shooting, you have to find the time to go look at those locations. And so like you, you really just can't have that in the back of your head, you know? Yeah. You, once they get it, you'll do the blocking, you'll be good. Yeah. But as long as it's shot listed, and, and that's the hard thing. It's like the reality is you don't have a shot list until you have a location. <laughs> and that's just how it works. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you don't know where you can put any camera right um and uh yeah so so once we started getting those locations we started trimming that shot list because that's what really takes time right you know mm -hmm. you have 10 shots to get to it's gonna take you all day yeah you know um so yeah so it it once we started getting those locations that shot list was everything mm -hmm. you know shot list and blocking that's it that's what will get you through it every single time. Yeah. Um, and you're, and you're kind of, uh, you're tweaking it and finagling it the, you know, week day before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're finagling it every <laughs> single up to the setup. second. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Up to the next setup. Wow. Um, so one, one of my favorite things that I, that I embarrassingly just recently discovered is, uh, you know, motivated camera composition, like, yeah. um, blocking and what and how that's conveying the story in a uh, non um, auditory non spoken word way do you have like a style or sort of inspiration or, um, or way that you do that yeah i mean i think it's i think it's a lot easier than people think yeah you know mm -hmm. if your characters are running away from something and you're following them great you're setting the mood yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because realistically, your camera is the audience, mm -hmm. you know? And if you want them to feel a part of that group running away, then have the camera running with them, you know? It, right. it's Shaky cam. Yeah. It's like pretty simple. Um, but like approaching a scene, approaching every scene that way is, I think, super important. Yeah. Because I can't stand unmotivated movement. It's mm -hmm. just kind of annoying to me. Yeah, J.J. Abrams. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just annoying to me. And that sounds really snooty, but I don't care. I think, I yeah. think you know. Well, I, I found even, even before I knew what that was, there were scenes in movies that I'm just like, this bothers me and I don't know why. You're right. And it's because the camera's moving for no reason. Or sometimes it's super effective. Why do I love that scene? Yeah. Why yeah. is Scorsese, why are, why is Goodfellas impossible to turn off? Right. Right. Yeah. Um Yeah, so like I I thought that that was super important and a lot of the things that we did is we just kind of wanted for that first 30 minutes to put the audience with these guys. We wanted it to feel like you're a part of the group now. Mhm. Mm Cause that's what our our main character's doing. So we wanted the audience yeah. to feel that way, you know. Yeah, yeah. So like all the camera movements in that first thirty minutes, it it feels like you're right behind this guy. You're mm -hmm. right next to him. You're getting involved too. Yeah. Um, Secondhand blow. 
Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's... I don't know if I have a style. I, I've I've started to realize in the editing room we're doing some really cool things that I think will be very memorable. Yeah. Um, but we'll we'll see if they resonate or not. Cool. Nice. Um, awesome. So then, like, you know, one one thing for me, you know, I'll shoot a day for on my movie that I've been shooting for a year so far, just mm-hmm. on no budget. We shoot like one scene a month. And like after the day's over, like I'm fucking exhausted. Like I'm just worn the fuck out. And I'm like, if I did this for, you know, every three day, three weeks, for, yeah. like several months in a row, like I feel like I might go insane. Like, yeah, man. H- how did you maintain tough. your sanity? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> but once you're there, it's just like you care about this so much. Mm-hmm. And, and it's embarrassing to say, but like even my AD, like, when it hits lunchtime, I'm looking at it as great. I have another hour to go through this setup, this next setup in my head and figure it out. Yeah. While my ADs is like, Seth, you got to fucking eat, man. Like, <laughs> I can stop. <laughs> Hook it to my veins. Yeah. It's just like one of those things that you care about it so much. Yeah. That you forget these like, yeah, I should drink some water. <laughs> you know, like. I haven't gone to the bathroom all day. <laughs> yeah, I haven't gone to the bathroom in eight hours. It's like, wow. Yeah. Um. But it's cool, too, because once you start to realize that you're making something really unique and one of a kind, even though you're, you know, you're shooting it out of order and all that other stuff, but um, you start to see it come together so much that you just want to keep going. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And majority of the time, like, you know, you're... Your crew doesn't want to keep going, you know, <laughs> like it's been 14 hours. They want to go to sleep. Yeah. Um, but it's funny though. Like you start seeing those actors and you start seeing the, the, uh, the crew that like really see what you're doing in terms of like the bigger scale of what it's going to yeah. look like, the style it's going to have mm-hmm. the super moody moments and emotions that have been brought into this. And, you know, by the, you know, by the start of the second week, majority of the crew was hyped to come to work every day yeah. because they knew that something really cool was happening. Yeah. Yeah. This, this isn't just for a paycheck. Like right. this, this guy, there's not enough. You literally couldn't pay someone enough money to give this project the attention that you're giving. It. Right. Right. There's no way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it becomes a very infectious thing. Yeah. That when people start to see that and they start to like, to really enjoy being there Mm -hmm. that's awesome man so what what was like the what was the gnarliest thing that happened on set that you're like wow can't believe i didn't uh die or burn the set down or have everyone quit (laughs) yeah let me think (laughs) i mean there were there were just a lot of it's tough because like i personally believe in like um telling everyone thank you mm-hmm. like i think that that goes a lot farther than yeah people say yeah um yeah acknowledgement it's not you're, you're not just paying them you're like thank you yeah like i really i couldn't yeah. do this without you yeah type thing yeah. um because i couldn't you know without a crew you're doing it by yourself mm-hmm. um then so like i think just the hardest thing was just you just expect so much from your crew Mm -hmm. you know you expect so much like all right great i know that last scene took eight hours the next one needs to be up in 30 minutes let's go Mm. and i know that that's pretty much exactly what i say on set you know Mm -hmm. and it's and it's crazy because every single time the crew realizes that every second counts if they go into a scene with that mentality, it works beautifully because it's true. Every single second counts. If it takes, you know, those gaffers, however much long, 10 more minutes to do the lighting, that's 10 more minutes I don't have to shoot. Mm-hmm. And what's the whole point of making it look amazingly beautiful if I only have one take? Mm. Like, it doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Um, so the crew, you know, they, they did have to put up with, 
you know, the AD and me and a lot of the producers like really being on their backs of like, guys, we have to pick it up or we're just not, there's no yeah. point of us even being here. Yeah. Um, and so that was, that was probably the biggest thing that just kind of, you know, you're really working people into the ground. Yeah. And I should have told them more thank. I should have gave them more thank yous, you know? Yeah. Because they were the head of it. Well, I think just the fact that you are conscious of that. I yeah, mean, I really try to be. I try. Yeah, yeah, I really try to be, but. <laughs> you know. That that was like one of the uh, the first books that I read, like that sort of helped my career was How to Win Friends and Influence People. It was an it, amazing book. Amazing book. Yeah. And um, I just remember like my first job in a, in a corporation or I'd worked for NASA of all places. And my, my boss was just, he was just an asshole. Never yeah. said thank you, never appreciated anything. And I was like, I was like, you are giving me the most valuable lesson in my career right now to like, that when you treat your people like this, it demotivates them a thousand percent. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. And it I'm really like, does. I will always just like freaking go to town with my thank yous whenever totally. somebody freaking does anything. It's super important. Man. Yeah. And you know, even if we are making a really dope movie, if you're treating people like crap, yeah, they don't give a fuck what you're making. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, dude, fuck this guy. Yeah. You're, you're make believe movie. Yeah. Yeah. You're so self-centered that you can't even say a thank you. It's just like not worth yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. So do you have any, um, any tips for like motivating crew cast? Cause I know shit gets, uh, you get into that. I don't, 13, I, I wish power. I had an answer for that. Yeah. I really wish I had an answer cause it'd be worth a million bucks. <laughs> I mean the thank yous for sure. That's which I think the thank huge. yous help a lot. Yeah. It's just like, I think you have to, you have to thank people twice as much as you think you do. Yeah. Because there was a point on set where, um, that was my phone. <laughs> We're like, I was telling the crew thank you every single day. But like there was a moment where the DP came up to me and was just like, Seth, you got to say thank you more. It's just like, dude, I say wow. it every day. What do you want? Like, so it's one of those things that some people just need a little bit more. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's um, awesome. I, I, uh, so I, I pay my, uh, the people that work for my company and anybody that, you know, works on my movie, I'll send them like PayPal, Venmo or whatever. And there's always that little uh, comment section. And I always make sure to just like write something specific that they did that I was really thankful for and say like, thank oh, you so cool. much. You f you're killing it. Like, couldn't do this without you. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And I, and I honestly believe that they're like, they're stoked to get that money, but like that makes them happier. Dude, it's pretty, <laughs> it's, it's so small things yeah. that like really, really um, kind of go a long way. And that's kind of something that, like, I would encourage everyone to do because it's, like, the small things that, like, like, for example, every single time what I do is with majority of my investors, like, for, for Christmas or for, like, New Year's pretty much, I write them a card, mm -hmm. right? And I write this card that is, like, kind of wax stamped shut. Cool. And you, like... You know, you pretty much because you're it, a lord. Yeah, yeah. It's just you just kind of make it a big deal. You know, it's like yeah. something that you don't see a lot. Right. And you know, you tie a really dope string around it, and you do whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, you write in beautiful cursive and all this stuff. Yeah. But just to like, it's small things like that. Like, when was the last yeah. time you got a letter from Dude, someone just never. randomly saying like, "I really enjoy being in business with you. Yeah. I couldn't do this without you." Yeah. I can't wait to see what else we do. Yeah, like even if it's small and simple. Yeah, I I really feel like there is so much value to sending someone like a, a handwritten thank you card. It's huge, man. Yeah. To put it in the mail, do it right. Yeah. Um. I I recently met my new girlfriend's mom for the first time, and we stayed at her house in Cleveland, and she like took us out to dinner and made us food and got us all these snacks, and paid for us to all get a massage, and it was like so sweet and thoughtful. So when I got home, I bought a thank you card and mailed it to her, and she got it a week later, and she was just called my girlfriend all like a Twitter. It was super Yeah, excited. because it's just the small things, dude. Yeah, yeah. The fact that you went out to the store, got a card, thought of something, wrote it, was yeah. like a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, hell yeah, man. 
So you uh, you survived production, and now you're into post production, and you're editing that bitch and and yeah. slowly going insane. Yeah, it sounds like. Yeah, <laughs> can you tell us about uh, that process? Yeah, I mean it's just it's just rough, dude. Like criticizing your own work every single day is a must, but it's mm-hmm. also like really unhealthy. Yeah, you know, it's just yeah, just from like a motivational <laughs> perspective. Because you're seeing something, you know, the first time you see anything, the first time you see an assembly cut, it's always going to be crap. Like like Martin Scorsese has a quote where he says that. If you watch your first cut and you don't want to cry, something's extremely <laughs> wrong. Um, so, like, you, you got to know that even the best feel that way. Right. You know, Spielberg and Scorsese and Tarantino, they're all like... It's always crap. Yeah. And he and Tarantino even says like the first draft of his scripts aren't even worth reading. They're so bad. Well, he's like basically um, he can't read or write. He's so bad at spelling. Wow. <laughs> That's he's, he's illiterate. I believe. <laughs> I believe it. Um, so like, it's just kind of one of those things that, and you know, you're gonna leave a ton of crap on the editing floor. You just kind of got to accept it. Yeah. So like we've cut probably, our first cut was two hours and 10 minutes. Nice. And the one we turned in the other day was an hour 50. And we're guaranteed going to get it down to like an hour 40. Wow. So that's pretty much 25 minutes out of the door. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as the editing process, do you, like, did you edit your previous work yourself? Yeah. 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 I've never had an editor before. Yeah. How how has that transition of sort of direct control been for you? Um, it's interesting because cause you really have to respect the person that you're working with. Because if you have a crap taste in movie, then I don't want you to edit my movies, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. But it's, you know, it's nice to never having to touch a, uh, you know, yeah. don't the have keyboard. To sync anything. Or, yeah, you don't have to do anything. It's, <laughs> it's beautifully composed when you get there. Wow. Um which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, but it still takes time, you know. You're sitting there looking through everything, just kind of waiting. And then once you find it, you throw it in there. And it still mm-hmm. takes forever. Um, and I've just realized that, like, patience is the biggest thing through the editing process. Mm-hmm. Because it takes forever. No matter how well you shot it, it takes forever. Yeah. And that's that. Um and so, like, there's so many times in that editing booth that I just got to take a deep breath. Yeah. Because you're in the same place for 14 hours with the same people doing the same thing, looking at the same scenes. Jeez. And it, I think it drives anyone's cra- anyone crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know? I, I, uh, I'm I getting images of the lighthouse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how long have we been on this edit? Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, so... Damn. How, how many uh how many scenes can you edit in like a day? Like one, half of one? Yeah, probably about two. Two scenes. And even then, you know you're going to have to look at them again. Yeah. It's not perfect. You just have to like get the base of it down of all right, these are the good takes. This is what comes across. Of course it needs to be trimmed, mm-hmm. but we'll do that on the next pass. Nice. Um so one thing with editing that, that always uh, intrigues me that, that um, I think I've read or heard somewhere that like Scorsese kind of pre-edits his movie like in the writing shot list and uh, you do. blocking. For sure. You do. Yeah. And you should. Uh-huh. You should know like, yeah, if you just want to play this out from the wide, great. Just shoot the wide. There's no reason mm-hmm. to get any other coverage. Just make sure it's exactly what you want. Yeah. Um. Is there a few scenes like that in Echo where it's, you know, the DP was like, you're sure this is all you want? I was like, yep. Wow. And you have to know that because if you're grabbing shots that you know you're not going to use, you're wasting money and time. Right, right. So, Damn. So you, you actually, um, you kind of pre-edited the entire Yeah, I mean, you have movie? to. Yeah. You have to. You can't just say, I'm going to get two mediums, two close-ups and a wide mm-hmm. and just kind of figure it out. I mean, sure, you can, but that's what... TV is, you yeah. know what I mean? 
Like there's a reason people love movies and it's because people are making distinct decisions on what a scene's going to look like. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you have to use that to your advantage. You know, like if you hold on characters uncomfortably long, you should, you know, if that's how you want them to feel like you have mm-hmm. that authority. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Well, I am, uh, I am loving this, man. I could ask you questions all day, but I know that, uh, you're a busy man. Um, so my, my final questions are really, um, you know, do you, do you have any say in the marketing for the movie? Um, that's a good question. Um, uh, I mean, I think the thing is, is as you can probably learn from this, I'm kind of a stubborn guy, but I truly, yeah, I truly believe that the vision that I have for it is like either on par or better than what other people come up with just because I've been attached to it so long. Yeah. You know it better than back and forth. And so like when it comes to marketing, I will listen to anyone because that's not my, that's not my forte. I get it. But at the same time, like, like when it comes to posters and, um, obviously the cut of the trailer and, t-shirts and all that type of stuff i mean like my approach to it is like i will personally pay to make the t-shirt that you need to sell to show to you that it's better than what you're coming up with Mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah so it's like when universal starts doing their campaigns and stuff like that i can walk in show them a t-shirt and say what do you think Mm-hmm. And so it's not something that, oh, we got to make that. It's already been made. I already have 100 at the house. I can give you the vector file and you can just go crazy. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of how I approach it is like, and if you don't like them, cool. I don't give a shit. I'm like, great. Show me what you think would be awesome. Like, let's yeah. let's figure it out. Yeah. Um, but I think that it's hard to get people to think, oh, yeah, that would be cool. I just need to see it. Just show them an example. It's yeah. been great. I'll spend the hundred bucks to get a few made. Right, right. You know. Yeah. Um, it's funny that you asked that because we're I just put in a few orders for a few different styles of t-shirts nice. just so that you know when you're at any film festival, like you know you can at least give your producer some. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Nice. I, I expect to receive one. Uh, yeah, dude. I got a ton year. of them. <laughs> I'll, I'll wear it at Sundance. Yeah, I got too many of them. I'll, I'll rep at Echo Boomer. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's cool. And what's the what's the distribution plan? You guys are going to enter it into festivals? Yeah. So um, we, uh, we're trying to get it into Sundance this year, which we just weren't ready. Yeah. I mean... The deadline was like September and yeah. we stopped shooting like September 5th. Yeah. So it's like, I'm not going to show you just a nasty, <laughs> gross delivery cut of my movie, you know? Yeah. Um, so we had to wait, sadly. Um, but uh, the next big one is South by Southwest, mm-hmm. which um, I think once South by sees this movie, I think they're, they're going to have no problem accepting it. I think they're going to think it's really cool. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we're also gonna try to do Can see if Can Sweet. works out. Yeah, I uh, I just randomly booked a flight to uh, Paris last week for like two hundred and eighty bucks. What? And it's uh, there's some overlap with Can, so I'm planning to be there as oh, well. So dude. give me two shirts, bro. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, so yeah, I think that's kind of the next step, and and how they kind of want to approach it is, you know, we'll we'll screen it. Um, we'll make sure that CAA and Universal and they're going to get kind of a private screening before we even show it, but it'll probably be around the same week Mm -hmm. and then they'll get audiences reaction on it, see how it's taking and then decide, uh, like the exact dates on the theater release. Mm -hmm. So nice. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 I haven't read the scripts. Um, I just know what you've told me about it when I've did my research on it, but it sounds like it'd be perfectly in line with, you know, all the amazing movies that are coming out from, uh, like Ari Aster, Riley Stearns. Sure. Um, and you know, it hits a really cool demographic and it's about a generation that really hasn't been talked about much. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so I think people are really going to like it in the fact that it glorifies it and then it also tears it down. Yeah. Which is great because yeah. like everyone knows millennials are kind of full of bullshit <laughs> and we are, and that's cool. Like I have no problem yeah. admitting that. Yeah. Um, Makes for some good stories. Sometimes. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. Um, that's awesome, man. So my final question, which is probably a lie because I'll probably ask another question. Uh, what what would you do different next time, or for your next feature? What what would you do different? Mm, um, th- that's like a a pretty big question. Um, I think I would. Uh, it, this one I really didn't get to choose some of the people that I worked with because I wasn't in the position to do so. Mm-hmm. Um. And you just got to realize some people you work with really, really well and some people you don't. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just like slowly picking the ones you love, kind of filtering out the others. Um, And I think it's just a trial and error thing, you know? Yeah. Um, And there were some actors that I worked with that were absolutely unbelievable. Like I would cast them again tomorrow in a heartbeat. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I think... um, I think that's like a really, really big thing. And like a lot of it is understanding what other people are there for, right? Mm -hmm. Because like some producers are just there to kind of get a bump in their career or whatever. And I don't think that that's healthy to like work with those people. Yeah. Um, And more selfless. Yeah. and, And just people that are there to truly work. Those are the people I want to work with, you know, Yeah, yeah. that really know how to stretch the dollar and put yeah. it all on the screen. And mm-hmm. because I'm like, who cares what your budget was? If it doesn't show up on the screen, who cares? Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely what I would do different. That's awesome. It's just a, it's a lot about the selection of people. And it's tough when you're doing your first one. Like you don't have a selection. It's yeah. like the people who are gonna do it or gonna do it and that's that Mm -hmm. so yeah that's awesome man um well thank you so much for being on the show and uh, yeah of course i could sit here for another 19 hours and (laughs) continue to come up with questions for you um but where where can people find out more about you where can people um um, hear more about the movie yeah um i'd say to watch out for it at south by this year Mm -hmm. you know if south by will have us sweet um which that's going to be a big one. And then, you know, I'd say by the time South by kind of happens and by, I think what probably April of 2020 we'll have a release date. Nice. So yeah, that will yeah. be cool. That's awesome, man. Okay. I totally lied. My last and final question. Sure. Um, what, what are you working towards? Like what, what is your, your grand vision of uh, the end of your life, you're looking back, you're like, I'm so glad that I did these things or this thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, like, I know that this is something that I'm going to do forever. And I know that already. And I think that's a really big blessing to know that. Mm -hmm. Um, But, like, for me, it's just, like, such a big deal to make movies that make people feel and make people talk. Because, like, like for example, with Echo, it's one of those things that I want people to have, it, like, once they watch that movie and they go home with whoever they watched it with, on that 20-minute drive home, that they have, like, an intelligent conversation about the film. Yeah. And for this one, it's about Echo Boomers, you know? It's about millennials and how they approach things and, and is it healthy. <clears throat> and, like... I don't care if you agree or disagree or whatever, but just to have that intelligent conversation is exactly my goal as a director. Mm -hmm. And to show you things that do make you uncomfortable and comfortable and make you feel something, like those are the two biggest things as a a director. Mm. So like, yeah, you know, getting an Academy Award would be fucking awesome. But like, (laughs) it's all about, I think, just like the roots of it of like making things that people feel and that people Mm -hmm. can talk about and they feel somewhat invested in because they have an opinion on it too. 
Mm-hmm. It's just nice. That's I think great. that's it. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I, uh, I I like to think that I'm striving for the same thing. Yeah. And that's why I love movies in the first place, because the conversation afterwards, the things that made me think of, I yeah, wouldn't yeah, have yeah. gotten without them. Totally. So, totally. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. Um, well, thank you again so much for coming on. Um, I love commentary tracks. Will there be a commentary track for Echo Boomers? Um, that's a good question. You got you got to promise me right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I don't even know how, how how you go about a commentary track. Like, do you just hire someone to shoot you as you're watching your movie? And I be think like, man, so, Man, this yeah. seems, yeah. Yeah, I could do it for you, man, if you need. Yeah, dude, totally. <laughs> the setup, man. Yeah, totally. <laughs> cool. All right, brother. Well, thanks again for yeah, coming dude. on the show, of man. Course. Can't wait, Can't wait to see the movie.